Okay, wonderful. Thank you all for joining us again. Um, this is the May edition of the Link Tech Talks, and we are very fortunate today to have with us Joachim Moens and Spencer Nelson, who will talk about uh, about asteroid discoveries, and they will present Adam and Thor. Uh, so Joachim Moens, uh, he is a research software engineer here at the Department of Astronomy at the University of Washington, interested in big data and software-driven solutions to problems in astronomy. And for his doctoral thesis, he worked on algorithms that discover minor planets in the Rubin Observatory Solar Processing Pipeline, and on this uh, novel algorithm, Tor, that he will present to us today. And he is joined by Spencer Nelson, who is a principal software engineer at the Asteroid Institute. Um, he received bachelor degree in astrophysics from Northwestern University, worked as principal engineer at Amazon and Twitch, and then wrote software for Vera C. Rubin Observatory and Zwicky Transit Factory. And now he works on software design architecture for the Adam platform that he will present to us today. Okay, so Joachim and Spencer, why don't you take it away? Yeah, so thank you so much for that introduction. Um, but yeah, so today Spencer and I are gonna talk about Adam and Thor. And we're actually going to talk about it in reverse order. So I'll introduce Thor first. Um, then I'll introduce what Adam is, and then our plans for Thor on Adam. And then Spencer will take over and kind of discuss some of the the large scale issues that we're having with kind of realizing this this vision. Um, but before we go into uh, like too much uh, uh, detail, I kind of want to first paint a picture of what the solar system looks like in terms of the number of small body populations. Um, and right now we know of about 1.3 uh, million asteroids or so. And in 10 years time, something remarkable is gonna happen. That is LSSP will finish its 10 year survey and the number of uh, solar system small bodies that we will know of is gonna increase by a dramatic uh, fashion. And so for example, LSSP is predicted to discover 5 million man belt asteroids. It'll quadruple the number of uh, near earth objects. And then in the outer solar system, we're talking about an order of magnitude increase for the TNOs and an order of magnitude increase and some change for Jupiter Trojans. And so this is really an exciting time because each of these small bodies represents a data point that we can use to, um, to study how the solar system evolved over time, okay? Another way to say this is that actually LTP is gonna discover more asteroids and comets in the first two years of its survey than have been discovered in the preceding 220 years that started with the discovery of Ceres in 1801. And this is actually a conservative estimate. We've run simulations to show that LTP will achieve this feat in just the first few months of its survey. For example, there are uh, simulations that have shown that LTP will submit 10, uh, sorry, 100,000 new main belt asteroids per night for the first few months. So that just gives you the kind of the scale at which we're talking um, uh, in, in terms of just the discovery potential of a single survey. So one question that you might have, or at least one question I hope that you might have to make this talk uh, kind of interesting is how do these kind of surveys discover minor planets? And it really it all revolves around observing what's known as a tracklet. Um, a tracklet is a intranight combination of uh, point source detections, typically measured from difference images, but that doesn't always have to be the case. Now, the reason that you observe tracklets is that in a single image alone, like the one on the right, we can't actually easily, it's very difficult to, to uh, differentiate stars and asteroids. That's where asteroids actually get their name. And it's not until you take a series of back-to-back -back images uh, that you can then start to discern the motion of asteroids relative to the stellar background. And so that is effectively what a tracklet is. It's a measurement of this motion in catalog space, okay? And so that's exactly what LSST is gonna end up doing. It's gonna try to observe three of these tracklets over about 15 nights. So it'll take an image of the night sky, 20 to 90 minutes later, it'll come back and take a second image. It'll have its first pair of detections, make that into a tracklet. Then two to three nights later, it'll come back, take a second pair of images, get a second tracklet. And then again, two to three nights later, on average, it'll come back, get a third tracklet. Once you have three tracklets, that's enough for a discovery candidate. And that's how you enable these millions of discoveries. Now, it sounds simple. Here's what a single difference image from LSST's predict will look like. All of those red points are moving objects. And so LSST, this is a single image. LSST is continually taking images for 15 nights. And so you have thousands of these images that you have to do kind of connect the dots game across. And the thing I, I wanna stress here is that what LSST is going to do is state of the art. Um, it has never been done before to just rely on uh, using two detections to make tracklets. Surveys like PanStars 
Catalina and Atlas, the, the, the heavy hitters in terms of asteroid discovery, all try to get uh, tracklets with three or four observations, so triplets or quads. But LCT is going to try to do this with just two length detection tracklets. That's already really impressive and, and state of the art. OK, so to take a step back, we've just learned that to discover minor planets in astronomical surveys, you have to observe tracklets. And this kind of has two consequences. The first is that in order for you to build tracklets, your survey has to revisit the same field at least twice in one night, in some cases three times, in some cases four times. And so that actually puts a very strong constraint on the cadence of your telescope. You have to revisit the same field in the night to be able to observe tracklets. The second um, kind of detail, and this is a little bit more subtle, is that any data set that was not constructed with this kind of tracklet building cadence is a data set that is now not suited to do small body discovery. And this is actually true for the vast majority of astronomical data sets. They were not designed to enable the discovery of asteroids. And, and so it's really these two considerations that led us to ask if we could come up with a different technique. Could we do something better and instead say, Let's remove the requirement to observe tracklets and instead try to linking single detections across nights. And, and one of the motivations of this is for a survey like LSST that it's gonna always revisit the same field. If we were to, to remove the requirement to observe tracklets, we could double the sky coverage it could achieve in a single night. Surveys like PanStars where they're building quads, we could quadruple the, the sky coverage. We just remove the requirement to observe these tracklets, okay? And it was this desire that led to the development of trackless geocentric orbit recovery, or THOR. I'm going to quickly describe how it works. Um, but basically, what THOR does is it shifts the kind of the linking problem to that of a linking problem in a, a reference frame that's centered on the motion of test orbits. And so what we have on the left here is a catalog of observations. You can imagine them coming from a telescope. We, in that catalog, we insert test orbits and we propagate that test orbit to all times where a detection of that test orbit could have occurred. And then as we're doing that, we're gathering this kind of red circle of observations at each point in time with it. And then we make a very simple assumption. We basically say, okay, let's assume all of the point sources in each of these circles is at the exact same distance from the sun as our test orbit at that time. And at that point, we've actually fully constrained the observing geometry and you can transform those observations into a co-rotating reference frame that's centered on the motion of that test orbit. And so that's what we see on the right. So in its own kind of reference frame, the test orbit is just going to be clustered at the middle. But the key insight here is that because so many asteroids have similar orbits, uh, objects that have similar orbits to the test orbit are going to appear as lines or curves in this image. And so we're transforming nonlinear motion from the left side to linear motion on the right. And we know how to extract lines from, from point clouds like this. Um, the way we do that, just briefly, is a three-dimensional Huck transform. We actually do it as a two-dimensional clustering problem. Um, so on the left, we see the kind of the non-zero velocity frame of a test orbit and detections uh, that have been transformed into the reference frame of this test orbit. And then on the right, um, if you look at that kind of the black uh, line that's in the lower, uh, lower right quadrant of the left plot, if we guess the correct velocity combination, we can convert that line, which is, represents another asteroid, into a cluster. And then we could run the cluster finding algorithm for every single velocity combination that we test. And then we extract those, those observations and run orbit fitting uh, to then actually fit an orbit to these potential discoveries. In other words, this is really just shift and stack in catalog space is the way to think of this. OK, so we have an algorithm that allows you, given a set of test orbits, allows you to discover other asteroids, which is kind of cool. Uh, how do we actually pick test orbits? And so we wanted to focus in our initial implementation really on uh, the area of faith space, where the majority of discoveries are going to be made in the next 10 years, i.e. the main belt and outwards. And we wanted to leave the NEO problem, which is significantly more complicated for future work. And so for the rest of this talk, uh, Thor does not work on NEOs yet. Um, in more detail, how test orbit selection actually works, we end up dividing the, the sky kind of in patches. And then for each patch, we look at the known population predicted to be in that area of the sky. And then we pick test orbits in bins of semi-major axis going outwards. Um, uh, and what that ends up happening, what that ends up yielding is about eight test orbits in the main belt, and then one test orbit we put in the outer solar system. So nine total test orbits per kind of fiducial patch on the sky. 
Okay, we have an algorithm. Uh, we have test orbit selection. Now let's actually run it on some real data. And so we uh, really developed Thor on data from the Zwicky Transient Facility. This was in large part uh, because uh, we at the University of Washington host the alert stream. So it's very easy to get access to these data because they're just local. And so we picked uh, a kind of two week window of observations in September. And one of the really nice things about ZTF data is if uh, an observation is made of a known solar system object, it's labeled as such. And so that gives you labeled data to test linking algorithms on. And so in this kind of two week period, then these kind of blue observations, there are 21,500 objects we consider to be findable. So 21,500 objects with at least five or more observations. We then asked, you know, given the cadence constraints imposed by requiring tracklets for discovery, what could a tracklet based algorithm working at 100% algorithmic completeness achieve in terms of discovery uh, on these data? And it turns out for the LSSD baseline algorithm, out of those 21,500 some objects, it could at best recover about 9,400. And then uh, the, the large number there, that's actually using Z mode. Z mode has a special kind of tracklet plus a single detection uh, working mode, but at best Z mode could recover about 14,000 of the 21,000 objects that we deemed findable. So what do we do? We divide the sky into different patches. Um, for each patch, we select test orbits I just described, and then we run Thor. Um, so we end up picking about 821 test orbits, all from the main belt and outwards. So these are all the little red points you see on this plot. And then we, we run Thor and we just unleash it on, on, this, on these data. And we end up actually pulling out or recovering uh, 21,000 of the 21,500 objects or about uh, achieving 97.2% completeness. And so if you compare that to the numbers from the, the previous slide, that's actually a factor of 1.5 to 2x discovery potential over trackable based algorithms. And, and the detail here is that this is the same data, right? It's the same data sets. Uh, it's, it's the exact same observations, so just two different approaches to the linking problem. Um, one of the cool details about this is that out of those 21,000 objects that we did recover, uh, 1,700 of them were recovered completely with singleton observations. So no tracklets at all, uh, which was a really cool, neat little result. Now, I'll admit this all sounds too good to be true. And, that's, and so here's the cost that you pay for this. So Thor is a computationally expensive algorithm. This took 18 hours on 600 cores. Whereas uh, the, the algorithm that's being built for LSST could have processed these data on a laptop in roughly an hour or two. So that shows the scale difference here. Thor requires compute power. Okay, so just to quickly summarize where we are with, uh, with Thor. So we have a linking algorithm that can work without tracklets. Um, it, uh, if we have the compute power, we can uh, increase discovery potential by 1.5 to 2x over tracklet-based algorithms. What we have not yet shown is that we have not yet extended this to the NEO population, and we have not yet shown that it can actually be scaled for large surveys like LSST. So these are the two uh, remaining questions for Thor. Okay. All right. Um, so now I'm going to transition to introducing what Adam is. Before we talk about Adam, let's actually introduce the B612 Foundation. So the, the B612 Foundation is a private uh, charitable nonprofit organization, uh, really with the mission of of educating and preventing uh, uh, asteroid impacts against the Earth. It was founded about 20 years ago by two planetary scientists and two former NASA astronauts. And so the Asteroid Institute, which is a organization that both Spencer and I worked for, is a program of B612. So that's where that kind of all fits in. Uh, the Asteroid Institute is a virtual institute. Well, we used to call it virtual. Uh, now, post-pandemic, we call it remote. Uh, but it's in collaboration with the University of Washington. And the aim is really to, to do groundbreaking research in planetary science, typically kind of geared towards planetary defense. And the primary project of the Institute is this Atom platform or asteroid discovery analysis and mapping. It is a cloud-based astronomics uh, platform designed to enable compute intensive research. And right now we have an engineering team of four supported by researchers like myself and volunteers and interns. And one thing I do want to stress as well, this is all made possible by, by donations from people from over 46 different countries. So we are very grateful for that. Um, one, of the, the, um, one of the kind of exciting developments over the last few years, and this was happening as I was finishing my PhD, is that we've decided to really make Adam the home for the Thor algorithm. So we've seen that Thor is computationally very expensive. We need something that can scale. And, uh, and Adam is kind of really the op optimal candidate for that. And so the bulk of the work now in the future is really getting Thor 
integrated on Atom and really building it out as, as this kind of discovery service. More, more broadly, what Atom actually is, it's the combination of these astro astronomical data sets that we are working on ingesting and putting into a format that we can search for, for discoveries and do kind of recoveries, leveraged and supported by a series of services that act on those data sets with the ultimate goal of really trying to build this kind of space map. Um, but for Thor on Adam in particular, the dream, the thing that we're trying to accomplish is really build or enable this idea of discovery as a service to centralize the discovery effort to, um, to just one location. And, and what we mean by discovery as a service uh, is essentially real-time asteroid discovery on observations as they come in from telescopes around the world. And that's a very different paradigm from what's, what, what's currently out there where uh, each survey is building their own algorithm to handle their own data to do these discoveries where we really want to kind of try to uh, centralize that effort and just have it be open source as possible um, and, and just, just to try to maximize the discovery potential from these data sets. And one of the cool things about that is there's no reason why Thor can't, for example, discover asteroids between data sets. So we can start doing cross kind of survey linking at that, at that scale. Uh, one other detail that I think is worth, uh, worth knowing is that Thor will not be the only discovery algorithm that we are planning on integrating. There's been discussions about also including Heliolink, for example, on Atom. Okay, um, we actually built the first version of this a few years ago, and this was a lot of uh, Spencer's time and work, and so a huge credit to him for getting this, this figured out. Uh, this was very pre-alpha. It's no longer, uh, no longer reflects reality. It had a user base of just me. But we built this to, to, to try to demonstrate if we could we, we could do this kind of discovery service or discovery at scale. We needed a new data set to do that though. We found that ZTF is actually already a very well discovered data set. And so we end up going for something uh, that would at least start to approach LSST depth. And that's the NORLAB source catalog. The NORLAB source catalog contains about 68 billion point source measurements uh, measured from three different instruments. And uh, the, the, the big instrument there being uh, DECAM and during the dark energy survey. And so if you're familiar with the DECAM or sorry, DES footprint, you can see the famous DES tank here in the, in the, in the footprint of this data set. And uh, the reason we picked this data set is uh, um, DES did not on purpose observe tracklets. Those were only measured serendipitously. So this is not only a great data set for scale because of its depth, but also a great data set for trackless discovery. And one point worth noting is that at this point, it is archival data that spans seven years from November, or sorry, from September 2012 till November 16, um, no, 2019. So we we have a, a this discovery of service. We have a data set. So let's actually try running it, uh, running discovery of service on uh, the NSC data set. We end up uh, picking a very small sample, about 15% of one month of the seven years of data. Um, we then asked the same question we did earlier. What could a tracklet-based algorithm discovered in these 15% of, the, of one month of observations? And it turns out there's only 82 uh, asteroids in these data to have the correct number of tracklets for discovery to be, have been pulled out. We ran Adam Thor and we were able to pull out uh, 1,241 objects. Um, so that's actually a factor of 15 above what a tracklet-based algorithm could have done in that, in that same, uh, with the same observations. But again, the caveat here is that it's compute intensive. This took one and a half days on uh, 1,500 cores, right? So that's, that's the price you pay to enable this, this kind of discovery. One of the cool uh, byproducts was we actually ended up discovering 104 asteroids in these data, which we were not really expecting. Um, but to us, that really validated that this uh, is a, you know, that this discovery as a service, this Adam Thor concept is actually a technique that, that could work. There's, I have a small video here. I'm not gonna show the entire thing. Uh, we've been working with this visualization team at Open Space to, to create visualizations of, of discoveries. And as the earth, the blue line here reaches 12 o'clock, that's actually when we pulled these asteroids out of the data, which you'll find they'll be in opposition with, with the earth, which uh, um, is a great way to, to, to validate that, you know, at least one way to validate um, these discoveries. Okay. So we'll just let it reach, let it reach 12 o'clock. And yeah, so this is the discovery window. So there, you can see they're kind of in opposition. If you imagine imposing the DES footprint on there too, you could, you could see that as well. Okay, um, so I wanna end off my part of this talk by just saying that we've only gotten started. So we have a, a, a promising algorithm that's been validated for trackless discovery for the main belt and outwards. 
we still need to extend it to the NEO population. We still need to demonstrate that it can actually scale to, to, to uh, meet LSST's data volume. But one thing I wanna leave off on is that even with just a single data set, we've only processed 0.2% of the data and discovered 104 asteroids. So I'm just gonna let you try to imagine what we're gonna end up achieving if we are able to process the remaining 99.8% of just this one data set that we have. And there's many more that we're trying to, to search. So uh, with that, I'll move over to the next slide and pass it over to Spencer. Thank you. Let me turn the slides back on so I can control them and see my notes. Hi, everybody. So uh, yeah, this slide has a cheeky title. Um, the, the science is not the hard part. The, I'm going to pull us down from the beautiful celestial world that Yakim has presented really well of this wonderful algorithm and into the sewers that we call software engineering and how we get this to run. And it's going to be a little less uh, upbeat, I guess. But, um, but there's a lot of potential here for sure. Um, we have three jobs to do uh, when we're thinking about scaling up this algorithm. We need to get all the data, which just means point source catalogs, which is kind of nice. And we need to execute Thor in some way and then make sense of the output. And steps one and two here are really software tasks, and three is mostly back to Yakin. And this talk, ta this talk is really only going to be about step one. And I thought that step two would be the hard part, but it turns out that even step one has taken months. And that was surprising to me. Um, step two is not actually that bad. There's a lot of like inherent parallelism in how Thor is structured, that test orbits can be done individually. You can partition up source catalogs in ways. So that part is like relatively tractable and it's really hard to just get access to all of the data out there and combine all of the point source catalogs you might want. Um, there are three sources that we've been working on uh, and, and have ingested at this point. There's ZTF, this is with the transient facility. There's SkyMapper, an Australian National University project, which helps us cover the southern sky. And there's NSC, which um, Yakum talked about plenty uh, with like 400,000-ish public images, a lot of them from DECAM. Um, now, if I try to use these things, you know, I, I put pictures here of their websites for a reason. If I try to use these things, the first thing they all tell me is like, we have a Jupyter Hub. It's awesome. You should use our Jupyter Hub. We, we have all of the data locally and you can run code there. And uh, that's great, but I don't want that. I, for one thing, I don't want three different Jupyter Hubs for three different data sets because that just fragments the ecosystem. And for another, Thor is not really an algorithm where this is going to be the appropriate interface. I need so many more cores that I want to have a lot more direct control and be able to speak in languages like, uh, how is uh, memory pinned to each core? Like I want to be able to improve the efficiency of this algorithm. And so Jupyter Hub is like not an appropriate interface. And th that also means the answer is not like, give me a really big Jupyter Hub. Like that, that still doesn't really solve the problem. I want to be able to get Thor to run nightly. I need to be able to monitor it. I need to get access to the hardware. I need to have a better story around source and version control and how I deploy changes, how I test changes before I roll them out. I want to be able to take snapshots of lots of stuff. So in any case, hopefully this is convincing enough that like Jupyter Hub is not a sufficient answer. And so when we talk about making data platforms, what I really want is something that's more like programmatic access. I want to be able to like pull all of your data down and then run something across it, maybe on your hardware, maybe on mine. I'm not really too stuck about that, but I want to have a deeper kind of like programmatic interface. Um, so I want all the data and uh, the way that these services, at least for SkyMapper and NSC work um, for that sort of access is through a protocol called TAP, the Table Access Protocol. It has a um, long and very boring specification that's actually kind of very nicely written. Um, but the long and the short of it is you make like a SQL style query for the data and you get an XML response back or a CSV or sometimes like some obscure kind of hybrid formats. But, uh, you know, so you, you write queries and you ship them out and then you get a whole bunch of data back. Um, so I don't know, <laughs> like I want everything. Like Thor wants to use as much data as you can give it. And we want to see how well this scales on everything. So yeah, I don't know, like select star for measurements. Um, it turns out that's not really gonna work uh, for a lot of reasons. One of them is just like, that's way more than I care about. For Thor, I actually can be a lot more reasonable and say, we just want like positions and times that things were observed. And you know, there's a, a few more things here, maybe like magnitudes and stuff, maybe like a little bit more, but 
basically this is the story is I want to get, you know, a handful of pieces of information, uh, but that still won't work. That would take forever uh, to, to do that sort of like select from everything for something like NSC where we're getting billions of sources. Uh, so let's just get a little chunk of the sky. And this is kind of what you do when you're developing the thing and trying to make sure you understand the interface you're working with. So maybe we do this little patch of the sky and we get stuff. Um, this has a problem when you try to scale it up, which is that the density of observations varies really hugely. Uh, the brightest reddest dots in this image, you know, have hundreds of millions of objects from NSC. And then most of them have very, very, very little. And that takes a long time to query to, to hit the, the densest dots. Um, so you end up having the whole procedure being slowed down by just a few of those slow dots. Um, and that, that gives you a really nasty shape for your workload. You know, you need a lot of memory as much as your worst case if you have this homogeneous pool of workers, which is kind of the most natural way you would approach this, is you say, I, I slice up the sky, and then I have a bunch of computers, and all of the computers get their slice of the sky, and maybe I don't have as many as I have slices of the sky, but they continue, you know, doing their work and then trying to get another chunk. Um, the, one of the problems is you can't know the memory usage in advance or the runtime in advance. You don't know how many are there necessarily. And in fact, even with the tap queries, when you do select count of star within some region, it can take a really, really long time to get that answer back. So the memory used by these things is insane because of the XML of the VO table is another major problem here. Um, the underlying response that you're getting back, as I said, by default, and sometimes the only response you can get back is just an enormous sheet of XML. And the compression ratio here is like 0 0.3, right? Like you get three bytes of overhead per byte of scientific data, roughly. Um, to make matters worse again, Python isn't that awesome at parsing streaming XML. And so it's easy to double that again. So if you had like four gigabytes of floating point data, that might require 40 gigabytes of memory. Uh, so each of those workers that you have here is looking like a pretty big box. And most of the time you're not using any of that, but in, a, in, a, in order to cover the densest regions, you do need to have that kind of everywhere. So this becomes a really inefficient overall structure. Uh, but okay, fine. We throw money at it. We get the data just once. That should be fine, right? Uh, sadly, no, <laughs> because sometimes things don't just take a long time. Sometimes don't just take a very long time. Sometimes things just never complete. Um, most of these tasks would take about two minutes empirically, uh, sometimes eight or 10 minutes. And then occasionally it, we'd have it running for 30 or 40 hours and it just would never terminate. And we went all the way down to like S trace level to try to figure out what's going on. And there's no bytes coming in over the wire. It's just dead silence and we don't know what's happening. Uh, this is a scary and frustrating place to be in. Um, because there doesn't seem to be much rhyme or reason on which of these tasks is causing this problem. Um, weirdly, if you break it into pieces, so you say, okay, fine, I'll, um, I'll take that patch of the sky and I'm going to do really, really small patches, it will complete. But sometimes you have to get quite small. And, um, but this is very strange to me. Uh, in fact, the sum of those times will be way less than 30 hours. It might be like 20 minutes or something. So once you fragment, the, the query down, it gets much, much, much faster. This indicates that there's some sort of quadratic behavior or some blow up that's happening on the back end. I don't know what, but it's somewhere in there. Um, and it, yeah. So maybe we try this small unit of parallelism and put that everywhere. Uh, bad news, greater parallelism causes more tasks, which previously were fine to become the timeout bombs. So actually you get to a certain level of parallelism around like 50 concurrent queries where you're just knocking over the whole thing. You're knocking over the back end constantly. Um, 50 is not a lot of concurrent queries. So basically what our solution was to just like slowly eke it out in serial. We just like run a small number of queries and they all take a long time. And that's just kind of the way that the world works. Um, this is too bad. And you might say like, well, is this just an implementation inside of like the particular app server that we're hitting or some details of the backend? Oh, no. <laughs> like, I have no idea. I can't tell from the outside. No one could tell from the outside. It's really difficult to diagnose these things because of the, like, because of the way that we're structuring our interaction here, which is over this particular like specification driven interface. There isn't like a person I'm talking to necessarily. I'm just trying to use the computers. Um, 
I don't know, maybe it's a memory leak somewhere in there. It's just like very difficult to say. There's some things that I know it's not. It's not just the data volume that causes this like blow up. There's, um, it's pretty easy to see that sometimes there's more data and those ones complete quicker. And it just seems to be relatively non-deterministic, except then sometimes you hit particular shards that blow up. So I don't know, something weird happening on the back end. Um, now, that was just the first one, the first tap service we tried. Then uh, a coworker of mine, Nate, tried to do another one. And, you know, same story. He's like, well, I tried to, to query eight partitions. The first one fails with a null pointer. The other seven say, like, missing job list name. And uh, then I retried it and it just worked. And that's when we're like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to be in here anymore. I am done interacting with this tap service. And so we email them and we're like, can we mail you a hard drive perhaps or something like that? And then like you put all the data on that and then mail it back to us because that's going to be better. Um, now, so the net result, this was like kind of a complete mess overall, our, our project to get all this data. Like conservatively, this was probably like $5,000 per query or something um, because, you know, we have basically 100 engineer hours spent on trying to get this data out. We spent a gazillion CPU hours because we're running in the cloud and the only way to get all that memory is to get a box with a lot of CPU cores alongside it. And we get, you know, uh, a handful of terabytes. But remember, we didn't actually care that much about like most of the data involved. So it's this isn't that big of a number. If you're getting that over four weeks, then we're going at like the equivalent of a 240p video stream, like kind of like a really big GIF sort of thing. So this is not a, a fast data rate and we don't have much reusable code. There's lots of glitches that we're hitting in the back end. Um, so this does not look like a successful software engineering project. Um, and uh, it's not just a tap thing, I should say. Uh, we got ZTF data from tarballs and sometimes they're corrupted as in they're like zero length or they're truncated at some random spot. Sometimes they include the .ds store file of like somebody's MacBook. And uh, the person responsible for this is me because I worked on the ZTF tarball service. And so I have no one to blame but myself. <laughs> but uh, I think that there are deeper reasons. Like, so, so when we talk about like what's going on here, it's not, it's not that like TAP is a bad protocol or like the people at NSC are malicious or that I was evil to myself. Um, let's kind of like climb out of this sewer. <laughs> of software implementation details and get into the daylight of thinking about causes. And I think that there are lots of like levels for thinking about what's going on here. I think that the shallowest level is that we're using the wrong tool for the job. Getting all rows from a table is like not what TAP is about. It's not what it's for. It's for, for doing queries that are much more targeted and select star from the table is not the intended use case. And there's a lot of truth to this. And I think there's a lesson here, which is that when we are thinking about building data platforms, bulk access needs a separate API. Don't just say like, you can just do the same query, but more, and that provides sufficient bulk access for other software teams. That's not an appropriate answer because the query pattern and the behaviors of that system are gonna be so different when someone is trying to do bulk access. But then the second level of question is like, why was there no bulk access? And I think that's because most of today's interfaces are designed for research. Um, I think that they weren't designed with bulk APIs in mind. And the usual access pattern is much more like, uh, I've heard you have a lot of data. I have some code ideas. I'll work on a Jupyter notebook and hack on it for a while and try to see what happens. And when you're working on research, like the robustness of the remote API is like way down on your list of concerns. You're thinking in terms like, uh, you know, please make sure that I can get the air mass. Like that's important to me. You're not thinking, please make sure that the request parallelism is sufficiently high. <laughs> That's nowhere near your list of concerns. And so when we're, when people are designing these data interfaces, this is not something that they think about because that's not who the users are, which I think is completely justified. Um, but what's the reason for that? It's because funding and labor today are entirely research oriented. And uh, they come from like grad students and postdocs who are working on this like two to four year time horizon that is project oriented. And those projects are very individual rather than team owned. And so they don't really necessarily survive past the PhD thesis or whatever. And I think this is a big problem and it is making it hard for us to build software systems on top of the platforms that we're providing. Because uh, when you don't have that kind of like long-term vision for how you're providing data, 
then automated analysis and large scale work is becoming harder than it needs to be because we're starting to move into a, a regime of algorithms and research that has to have this substrate of, of solid software engineering because the data volume is sufficiently large. Like Thor, there, there isn't really a useful way to do Thor in a tiny scale. We need to, to use as much data as we can to actually make sense of whether this algorithm really works. So it requires a software engineering basis. Um, so yeah, I think that the next 10 years of algorithms require kind of new architectures at a couple of different levels. One is I think we need to start to design APIs for whole data set algorithms. Um, I think that we need to have better plans for how we transition from like research mode of a project into stable system mode where it is deployed and continuously used. And I think we need to start to fund more institutional ownership of systems. I realize this is kind of just like flattery for the link crowd perhaps because like this could be kind of mission statement, but I do think it's really important. And I think that we, sh we should try to see more projects in this light um, that there's kind of, there's a different mode and we need to build systems that allow us to get there. So that's all I have. That is my rant. Uh, thank you, everybody. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you for that optimistic message. <laughs> uh, Roy, thank you both. And uh, we will now open the floor for questions. Well, we wait for those to trickle in, but do you, Spencer, do you know for an LSST, what's the plan or do you have a feeling how will this work in LSST, which will obviously have even more data than ZTF or anything uh, that you mentioned? If the question is about how we like will consume LSST for the Atom platform, it's pretty sketchy right now. We are right. hoping that like maybe we can use some of the community alert brokers to get the alert stream or something and then uh, process that and consume it kind of like in a streaming fashion. But I don't think there's a very good story for how we get bulk access to um, to kind of like to to point source catalogs necessarily. Maybe there is, I don't know. Uh, there are a lot of people here from Ruben who could probably like right. correct me on that and say how we do it. Okay, Leanne, please. Hi, good morning. Uh, oh, I've lost my virtual background. It's a bit, oh, I must have turned it off yesterday. Hang on, I'm gonna put it on because it's, uh... Um, nice and with one. There, you don't get to see my house. Um, okay, thank you for those great talks. They were really good. I really enjoyed both of them. You guys have done some great work. I'm really happy I came along today. I had a bunch of questions. I'm going to start with uh, Joaquin. Um, so you talked about how this track trackless algorithm, Thor, can, uh, can remove the need for having the return visits intranight um, in the survey cadence. That's really exciting because that opens up a lot of possibilities in the survey cadence. And as I'm sure you know, we're very constrained in the survey cadence with trying to respond to very different types of science. You know, cosmology that wants, wants repeatability, uniformity, and solar system and transient science that wants very much the opposite. Um, have I think the answer to this is no, but I'll ask you anyway. Have uh, has this been taken into account in the phase two recommendations for the cadence? I don't think the fact that we would might use Thor for processing uh, LSST source system science data has been taken into account. I, in the phase two recommendations, they haven't modified the cadence, have they? Yeah, it has not. Um, and that's because it's not a one-to-one -one replacement for, for trackless, tracklet algorithms yet. We still need to extend it to NEOs and show that it can work at that scale. Um, but right. once we do do that, I, I, we definitely want to show that we can uh, you know, relax the cadence. Right, okay, that's what I assumed based on what you said about NEOs. So do you have a time scale for when you think this might be, you can demonstrate this would work? It sounds like you're confident it would work, it's just you've got a lot of work to do to, to, to get it in place. Do you have a sort of time scale like before the start of the survey? Could we possibly envisage or imagine a modification to the survey strategy before the start of the 10 year survey based on the improvements that Thor is, is giving us? Or the, the OS, I should say the, the new range of flexibility that Thor might give us in designing the cadence. I think I think start of the survey is perhaps a little bit ambitious, um, I, because that, to be able to demonstrate that Thor is doing what we think it's doing, I think we need to run it simultaneously with what uh, with HeroLink, right. and then show that we can we can uh, in LST data re uh, recover the same amount of asteroids. Once we show that and demonstrate that that works, I think that then the, there could be a good conversation about seeing if we can maybe transition or come up with some more flexible cadence to accommodate both algorithms. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, uh, our, our goal in the immediate future is to make Thor, to extend its NEOs, that's what we'll be working on the next year or so, 
and then also um, to make it scale to LSST. And then once we're in that position, we can then do the HelioLink uh, chocolate-based comparison. Okay, so, so in any case, you'd want a couple of years of LSST with both HelioLink and Thor to demonstrate. Uh, yes, I, I think so. Works before we might envisage any shifts in the cadence or modifications in the cadence. Yeah, I, I mean, unless we, we get it built before then and somehow we, we can convince everyone that it's working. Uh, but I think in absence of that, I think we would need a few years of LSST with traffic. Wow. I mean, maybe if we had more delays, maybe that would give you the time, but I'm not pushing for any more delays. <laughs> Obviously, don't misinterpret that. Okay, thanks. Um, so another question, um, the, this, the Atom platform you, you mentioned, you've talked about having Thor running on this and you've talked about a lot of other solar system science with it. Is it a platform that you could might maybe envisage for any type of algorithm? Could it be cosmology, time domain? Is this a generic platform in which you could run any algorithm irrespective of the science focus? I think the answer is probably no. <laughs> I think it's okay. going to be dominated by an asteroid focus just because of how, like, coming from the Asteroid Institute and how we're funded and stuff. Um, and I think making a platform for generic algorithms kind of dilutes the effectiveness for the ones that you are targeting. Like, I think we'll be really, really good at running Thor and some recovery algorithms and other stuff like that and Helio Link. And um, so that's kind of our hope. Okay, what specifically is it about those algorithms though, that makes it, that makes the platform like specifically targeted at those, say, um, as opposed to doing a, a cosmology analysis across the entire LSST data set that also requires uh, large bulk data analysis. I think it's from the operational side. So it's the experience running Thor and understanding um, kind of its performance characteristics and then having a good monitoring tool chain, uh, having the data set really cleaned and, um, and well understood for what we're putting into it. So mm -hmm. I think that like, a lot of the work is not necessarily just um, having the data there and then running it, but it's also all the operational, you know, monitoring, logging, stuff right. around it. All that stuff is like really, really costly. And um, and it's hard to make it completely generic across different implementations. But, um, okay. Yeah. All right, so you're very much focused on solar system science with this yeah. work. Yeah, okay, so it's, it's a good place to start. Um, I have one more question. Maybe two. Um, I just come. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. If, if, unless no, I'm no. Go, 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 go. Those are excellent questions. You are you are knocking down from my list. Yeah. Very good. Okay. All right. So um, IBOA. Yeah. I, I thought you. I found your walkthrough of um, TAP very interesting because I mean we, obviously we're using TAP with the Ruben Science Platform. We've got a whole bunch of people working at the moment, but it's it, it, it doesn't scale to bulk access. There's no way. There's no way you can, for example, do catalog cross matching between two catalogs. You know, say the Dia catalog at ESA and the LSST one here. You can't do that over TAP, and this is clear. We understand this. I'm not as familiar with all the IVOA services you probably are, but is there no IVOA bulk access API? Well, we do have to address bulk access in, in LSST and we are thinking about it, but. It's possible. I came from the side of like, what do the data providers have? And what are the, like, they have like four interfaces or whatever. Which of these is like the most bulky? Mm -hmm. um, but good question to say coming from the IVOA yeah. side. What do they yeah, have? Okay, I'm not sure. I'll ask some. Um, I, Gregory Dubois Felsman is like he knows a lot about the IVOA. I'll ask him because we're also having to, to deal with that as well. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. If, if you could, yeah, if you could let the link maybe on uh, Slack channel know what you find out. I think more okay. generally, I think yeah. this is the problem we are finding. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And this is, you know, over the next 10 years, you know, once the LSST data set comes out, people are going to want to do a lot of cross catalog analysis. This is going to be a huge use case, and then that's before you even get to things like joint processing, where you start with sort of pixel level joint processing. I mean, I've been very much involved with Rubin and Euclid joint processing and developing what we might do there. And, you know, you're already starting from two massive great raw data sets and wanting to do joint analysis at the pixel level. So this is also uh, a use case for the sort of bulk data set API that you mentioned, which I agree we very much need it. And just before I go and hand over to Melissa, um, I very much agree with a lot of your final comments about how we need to sort of change how we do research software, um, change how we, uh, but uh, what I say, science and computing, science and software engineering, they're not two separate things anymore. In this sort of large volume, he very heterogeneous sort of data set world, they are essentially the same thing. They are two parts of the same problem. And this sort of old way of looking at it, of, here's the computer scientist and here's the scientist. I mean, this has got to finish, it's just over. We've got to start thinking of it all as one problem. That the 
you know, we're not going to do any large scale science, you know, in the coming years if we don't have really solid software engineering foundations. So I very much agree with your last couple of slides that you said. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. All right. I'll be quiet now. Yeah, well, Mel Melissa worked a lot on similar issues. So she, uh, Melissa, please. You might be muted or I can't hear you, Melissa, even though you don't have a mute signal, but I can't hear you. I can give hear ah, you. You got you. We got ah, you. Okay. Sorry, I, my other machine blue screen in the middle there. Uh, so I particularly agree with the very last slide of uh, Spencer's where he said that he was just gassing up the Link folks because as a software engineer on Link, I had all sorts of like flutters uh, throughout the whole talk. Um, uh, Mario, part of Dirac and Link is actually at IVOA this week uh, proposing our like bulk access slash partitioned data thing that just all the slides just made me so happy. Um, uh, I guess aside from that, um, you mentioned that you know your monitoring and logging tool chains are not really generalizable, but I'm wondering like if they're even just a, a smidge generalizable since that's a, a problem that we're running into now with a lot of our pipelines. Uh, and you know, curious if you have more recommendations for other kind of open source solutions. No, uh, sadly, not really. I mean, to call them tool chains, tool chains right now is maybe even an exaggeration. Like, you know, we have lots of, it, it's more like you have a, a set of accumulated knowledge of like the ways that this thing breaks in the past. And then you're like, oh, I know what that means. It says, you know, that it wasn't able to spawn a Kubernetes node. That's actually because the node pool is hit some memory limit within that region. And like, you know, that's the kind of thing that like more comes from just the experience of running the same system for a little while. Uh, our tools themselves are pretty crummy, I think. I mean, maybe that's just the software engineers always want better tools, but um, yeah, we don't don't have any silver bullets. So. All right. Okay. I wish. I think you're muted, uh, Nevin. Oh my God, what a moron. Yeah, I was just exactly saying. So I was just saying, Rob, I see you writing comments about uh, IVOA and the conference after the ADAS. Do you want to maybe advertise that a little bit or? <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah, so you should go to ADAS and you should maybe go to the IVOA, talk to uh, the usual suspects at Ruben about that. And uh, uh, software is necessary, but not sufficient for all of the projects like this. Uh, and software definitely needs infrastructure and some uh, thinking about scalability. So there's my little yeah. elevator pitch. No, no, thank you so much. Thanks so much. Okay, if uh, I have one or two more questions, Joachim, we did, uh, and then you, we can go to a whole. Uh, I didn't quite get, you mentioned how you made nine orbits at the beginning, like, because you, you look where the asteroids could be, and like, and then eight, but plus one was nine. I didn't quite get that. How did you get these eight? You look where they are kind of in the, where they would be on the sky, and is it like, eight? where did the eight kind of come from? I didn't quite get that. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so for each kind of area of the sky that Thor is processing, we uh, get nine test orbits total, and and it's bins of semi-major axis. Eight right. of those bins fall in the main belt, and then the one uh, there's one bin that's for the outer solar system, and that's too efficient to get to ninety-seven point two percent. But like white eight and not sixteen or four. Oh, this was just this was just tuned to ZTF data. We we yeah. were able to achieve that. Yeah. Um, okay. There's no reason why, you know, if, if there's a population of, of small bodies that you're super interested in and you want to give me a very densely packed sample of test right. for that population, okay. we can definitely run that. This was just okay. a way to select, uh, algorithmically select test orbits for a survey like ZTF. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, Rahul, please. 
Hi, um, very nice talk. Um, I had one question about the numbers you're showing. I missed a few slides at the beginning, but uh, you showed how many asteroids you can pick up with this algorithm. Do you have an estimate of how many of these you're actually leaving out or what's the efficiency? Um, good question. So the only way for us, the only thing that we've done to calculate the, the efficiency is we've decided to trust ZTF's label. So if ZTF observed a known asteroid, would have labeled it as such. And we just took those labels to be ground truth. And of those, of those, of those labels, we recovered 97.2% of them. So we did leave uh, a couple of percent out. And this comes down to, to I mean, either bugs in, in the software or we just didn't have enough coverage in, in orbital, orbital phase space. But we haven't done anything more sophisticated than just look and trust that those labels are correct. Yeah. Right. But I mean, that's a difficult thing, but you don't have something where you are, say, trying this against simulations or something like that. Oh, you know, we, we definitely, we, so when we first built Thor, we ran it against simulations. Uh, we took the entire NBC orbit catalog and we generated a fake data set. And then we ran the same algorithm. And uh, again, so it's, it's against a known population. So it's not, we haven't tried against simulated populations, but in that simulated data set, we achieved something like 94, 95% completeness with the exact same algorithm. Um, you're definitely right. We should definitely do a study where we take an actual stimulated input population and generate uh, observations to see if we what, what our uh, well, you know what our coverage is. Yeah. Okay, great. But um, I, I guess I get I get the order. It's in the nineties, so that's nice. Thanks. Yeah. And a question about the computational complexity that you were referring to. Is this something because you are calculating so many orbits? Is this something that could potentially be speeded up through GPUs, but it's a memory problem of putting it in there or what's your... Yeah, no, no, it's a great, 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 great question. So we are definitely going to be looking at using GPUs. Uh, in the early days of Thor, um, we actually tried using GPUs to do some of the clustering. And the main issue there was just the ingress and egress out of GPU memory. But that's that's been fixed in the latest versions of, of uh, the NVIDIA framework they use for machine learning. So we haven't revisited since. But uh, there's definitely a speed up to begin when we are doing that kind of shift and stack in catalog space, that should be done on a GPU because uh, that would be much faster than the way we're doing it currently. Okay, so that's something you plan to do. Okay, great, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Great. great. Uh, Melissa. Yes, thank you. Um, I was wondering, since you were using the ZTF data set um, to see how the algorithm was working, um, how does the cadence of the ZTF survey compare to the the projected cadence of LSST, or were you able to pull out nights hitting the sky in the, in about the same cadence that LSST is expected? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, they have similar cadences. So ZTF tries to observe uh, the night sky every few days as well. Now the 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 so. They actually had to build their own algorithm called Z-Mode to handle their cadence. And, and so the way that Z-Mode works is you get two observations on one night, and then the next night you come back to that same field and get that third observation, and then you make kind of a linkage across uh, uh, across nights, but consecutive nights. For, for LSST, they're not planning to revisit that field for two to three nights later. So that's one of the fundamental differences. Um, but they're similar enough that, that I think I think you can make a, a fairly fair comparison and just in terms of needing tracklets for for discovery. Yeah. Um, so when you were trying to link the point sources uh, over multiple nights, um, how many or trial orbits would you choose for each set of points? Uh, so for so for the ZTF data where we had twenty one thousand odd objects, we did eight hundred test orbits. Um, for okay. the yeah, so for the Noir Lab source catalog uh, where we pulled out one thousand two hundred objects, we did a lot more because the, the 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 sky coverage was very different. Um, I think we did about two thousand test orbits uh, to pull out. 104 discoveries and uh, 1,000 something. So you're really only finding things that are in really regular orbits. We are. We're definitely expected orbits. We're we're finding things that are 
close to the test orbits in, 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 in kind of like orbital phase space. Um, so one of the weaknesses of Thor right now is that the, the, the discuss so the actual test orbit selection algorithm requires you to use the, the known population. Uh, we haven't gone and explored you know, the regions where there are no asteroids, um, but that's something that we can definitely, definitely do. And how would it um, work knowing that, that each of the two images for that night are in different filters, so the brightnesses would be different? Uh, so the, the awesome thing right now is we're not doing anything for brightness filtering. We just want the RA deck in time. Um, we might look at magnitudes just to do some validation that the, the end kind of linkages that we're making look reasonable, but we're trying to avoid doing anything in magnitude space because we don't want to bias ourselves against the you know, active asteroids or things that do have magnitude variations. Um, but yeah, so right now it's just pure, pure astrometry, no photometry. Thank you. Okay, we are very close to the top of the hour. So if there is a one last very short question, But if not, okay. Thank you, Spencer and Joachim. This was great. This was uh, this was great. And then uh, I hope you can join us. The next talk will be June eighth, and it will be given by Stephen Gwynn from uh, Canadian Astronomy Data Center, and he will talk about their Solar System Object Image Search uh, database. Maybe a little bit about bulk access, right? Again, uh, it will be the host will be Samuel Wyatt, who is a research scientist here at uh, UW as well as both I and Colin will be traveling, but you will be in very good hands. Okay, so I see, I hope to see many of you. Well, I will see the video, but I hope to see many of you uh, during the June talk. Thank you.